the words within this book we have are the words of life. Uh, we are going nowhere fast without them. And our whole life is built upon these words being true. True about Jesus and who He was as the Son of God, that He gave us sinless life as a sacrifice for us so that our sins can be forgiven, so we can stand before God at the judgment day, uh, not depending on our own goodness, but instead His forgiveness. Then having our bodies changed to live forever with God in eternity through the resurrection. Those words are contained within this book. And outside of this message, we have no hope. And as Paul said, without any hope, we may as well just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. There is no other future available to us. But how do we know this book's going to be relevant? And, and how do we know it's not just some old book from the past that uh, we dust off and its message should be replaced by something new? Uh, so we're looking at this uh, theme of God's influence through the Bible in three lessons. We looked at what the Bible is not. We did the blasting to make sure we don't have a wrong understanding. We looked last week at what the Bible is. That is a message inspired that is uh, initial by God, initialed by Him, and then His words were spoke to human beings that became the authors of the Bible, about 40 authors, over a 1,500-year span of time. And the book's all eventually collected together. That's what it is today. But what will it be in the future? Uh, right now as I speak, some have a uh, written Bible just like I have. Others have the Bible on the phone. They're going to scroll to what uh, we're looking at. And, and in the future, there's going to be something different. These phones are going to be antiquated. They're going to be something our great-grandkids will look at and find humorous, just like kids today find the rotary phone humorous. Where does the Bible fit if this kind of technological change is happening? What will the Bible be? We're going to try to envision the Bible's future this morning. I want to consider three scenes in Scripture. You don't have to look at them, but I want you to look at the, the pictures, and you'll remember them if you're familiar with the Bible, or I'll at least uh, point you to them. Uh, and these... Pictures all reflect different ways God's teaching or revelation to mankind has been recorded. Uh, Exodus chapter 34, the powerful scene where God gives the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law to the nation of Israel. Uh, he was taken up into Mount Sinai, and if you remember, and I'm sure Eileen you do, the uh, Ten Commandments. And that powerful scene in 1965 where Cecil B. DeMille had the fire coming right on the tablets of stone, uh, the Ten Commandments, and very powerful scene. But God's Word was put on tablets of stone. Today that would seem like, why? Why, why write on a piece of rock? Well, that was what was done during that time. You look at Egyptian hieroglyphics, words were written onto stone during this time. The medium in which communication was had outside of the spoken word was used all the way back 1,500 years before the time of Christ. You find in the time of Christ, in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 21, Jesus was asked to speak in the Jewish synagogue. They got up to speak and he read, and it says specifically in Luke's, Luke's gospel, he read from the scroll of Isaiah. It doesn't say he read from the Bible. Just as the Ten Commandments were not put into the Bible, they were put into tablets of stone first, Jesus read from scrolls. And that's how written communication was preserved in the first century. Long pieces of papyrus were attached together, then put into wooden scrolls, and they were unscrolled, and people read from a particular section. In the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, Timothy talks uh, Paul, I'm sorry, he talks to Timothy in the second letter about bringing to him the, the parchments and the scrolls. These were different forms or mediums of written communication that were present at that time. Never did he ask, hey, could you get my Bible? <laughs> Bring your Bible uh, to me. The Bible did not exist at any of these points in time, but yet God's teaching or his will or his revelation for mankind was given always in the form that was relevant at the time. So we're going to look at that today, and how we see the words of God, and then how that will likely look in the future as far as how we take in God's teaching. 
First of all, understand this. This is a long, wordy point, but I couldn't find a way to make it shorter. I tried all week, and I'm just going to go with it. The Word of God did not start as a book, and it will not end as a book. Just let that sink in a little bit. The Word of God did not start as a book. Written on tablets of stone, scrolls, parchments. There was not even any book till 1455 with Johann Gutenberg's Bible, where a moving type was invented. But God's teaching still was given in different forms. So it did not start as a book, and it will not end as a book. Here's our keynote verse. We have to see God's message for us apart from simply the words, the Bible. The words, the Bible, literally mean the book. But Bible is not in the Bible. You ever thought about that? The word Bible is nowhere in the Bible. It's on the cover of your Bible, but never does the Bible talk about the Bible. The teaching of God, or God's revelation for mankind, is most commonly referred to simply in Scripture as the Word, or the idea is the truth of God. And here's probably one of the best representative passages. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God, doesn't say the Bible, but the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of whom we must give an account. Notice here just the power of these two verses. The Word of God is alive and active. It divides and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It goes to the attitudes and thoughts of the heart. Everything is uncovered. The power of God's revelation goes beyond simply a book. A lot of times when we think of God's teaching just as, well, it's a book. Uh, books get tossed. Um, my classroom at school happens to be right next to the textbook room. And at the end of every school year, and it's going to come within a couple months, all the discarded textbooks are going to be replaced by new ones are sitting out there with a sign saying discard. Well, a few years ago, that was the latest textbook of history. Now it's to be discarded. Grab one if you want, the textbook assistant says. Books simply come and go, books that are simply the medium of words. But if there's something more powerful that will transcend a book form, that is what we want to give our attention to, and that's what's being communicated here in Hebrews 4. That God's Word is alive and active. It might be presented within a physical form, such as a book for a period of time, but it will not be limited to that. It's not like if we got, all, got rid of all the books today, God's Word or God's truth would just disappear and we'd be stuck. God would just use another form. Because that's what He's done in the past. He sent the law of Moses, uh, to Moses through the Ten Commandments that were, and other teachings that were on tablets, scrolls that Jesus himself used, Luke 4, parchments that Paul referred to, 2 Timothy 4. And we use books today. We have for a long time. They've got better and better in their structure. They started around 1455 A.D. with Gutenberg's Bible. They're used today, but clearly other forms of communication are transplanting books. You see more and more used bookstores closing down. A lot of people love books. I mean, I love just going into a used bookstore. I love the smell of a used bookstore. And I love just looking at books and searching for books that are maybe difficult to find. But now virtually every book I used to have in my library, I can find online. I can access things quicker online. I still prefer to use a book in my, my teaching. It's my most familiar zone of going back and forth. But things can be accessed quicker. When I'm trying to look up a, a verse, I remember part of it, I don't look at my Bible all the time. I'll go right to my phone, right to Google. I just put in a few words and boom, it'll take me right where I want to go. We are accessing things quicker. So the thought that the Bible is going to always remain in book form or that God's Word has to be in a book to be relevant is simply not the case. 
the revelation is always going to be relevant, but it may end up in different forms. Now, the forms need to be accurate. They need to reflect what God originally gave. But they can take on different forms and still be true. Today, digital form is what's the latest and it's going to continue to work. Books will still be around for a long time. But we're going digitally. But what tomorrow holds, what 100 years holds, I'm not sure. I try to think as I prepared this lesson, what, if I had to guess. By the way, the best places to figure out what's coming in the future, watch old Star Trek episodes, the classic series, or watch the Jetsons. The Jetsons cartoons. Those two shows have predicted more in the future technology we'll be using than the two other forms I know. But I tried to guess, and I figured we're going to have things implanted within us where something's projected, like right onto whatever we're, if we have something in front of us, it'll just be projected out of us. That's my guess. I'll be dead before that ever comes around. But it's going to be some other form, but yet the message is still going to be there and accurate. So don't expect the book to be around forever, but do expect the Word of God to be around. Do expect the Word of God to be around. Second thought is concerning the Bible and what it will be in the future. I want to just underline this point even more because this is what's critical to understanding tablets going by the wayside or parchments going by the wayside or books going by the wayside and one day these phones being seen as antiquated. The key is that the Word of God is much more than a book. It's much more than even the digital form that your Bible might be in right now. It's much more than that. Look what Peter says in this great text about the nature of God's work and its power to remain and be relevant. First Peter chapter two, I'm sorry, chapter one, verse twenty-two. Here Peter's gonna be talking about the truth of God that they obeyed. He's gonna talk about the power of that truth being preserved and being relevant in an ongoing way. Verse 22, 1 Peter 1. Peter writes, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. So that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Verse 23 now. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. But what? The word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. And this truth is presented in different places in Scripture. But this is probably the most powerful place I can think of where it's stated so directly. He's talking about change that happened in their life. He says, you've been born again. And they heard the message of Jesus Christ, uh, the fact that they were, uh, they had all sinned and they were guilty of sin. They needed transformation, redemption, forgiveness. And they responded to that. And they did from the heart. He says, you've been born again. He says, not a perishable seed, not of something transitory that just will evaporate or can be destroyed and no longer uh, have power. But he says, instead of in, something imperishable. And he calls that the Word of God, the living and enduring Word of God. He's indicating the power of the message is not in the form, not in a rock tablet that was originally used, not in a parchment paper, not in a scroll, or even today, not in a book. That is not the power. There's nothing about the book. There's nothing about this being a leather-covered book. And it's, I know it has unique paper. I mean, Bibles have a kind of unique form because they've always been kind of published that way. But it can have a different kind of cover. And, but what's funny, some people think, well, that's not a Bible. No, it's not a Bible. It doesn't feel like it doesn't have this kind of rice paper feel. Because a lot of times we get maybe too attached to the feel of the Bible or the look of it. But what Peter's saying here is the Word of God, that is the revelation of God, is much more than that. It's imperishable. It cannot be destroyed. Even though this can be burned and wiped out, the teaching is what's powerful. In the first century, they didn't have any kind of written form except there are a few scrolls of the Old Testament scriptures. Most truth was communicated orally. Paul will talk about the message that was preached to you or passed down to you. 
So the people that taught it had to be people of credibility. That's why miracles often accompanied the apostles or early Christians. Their credibility had to be established because they were the ones speaking. Because the power was in the message. What they did have, though, were the, what we call the Old Testament scriptures. And Paul will constantly refer to the scriptures uh, that were taught to them early on. Or he will commend Timothy about holding true to the scriptures he was taught even when he was young. And you can refer even today to, if you say, well, I don't want to use a Bible because that's not in the Bible. Say, I, let's turn in Scripture, too. And I've heard a lot of teachers do that. Let's turn in Scripture because that was used in uh, New Testament times itself to refer simply to the teaching of God. It was not the physical form of the book. Words will be preserved. And that's what God is promising here through the Apostle Peter. The imperishable, living, and enduring word of God. And he talks about, hey, grass is going to go away, and the flowers of the field, they're going to wilt, <laughs> they're going to fall. But the word of God, verse 25, endures forever. God's going to make it that way. The God who created a world into existence, who parted the Red Sea through Moses, brought manna from the sky to his people Israel, the God who raised his son from the dead, He's going to preserve his teaching one way or the other. We don't have to worry about all Bibles being destroyed or wiped out by a communist country or something like that. The teaching is going to be preserved. Uh, years ago, there was a fear that in China that all Bibles would be destroyed. It's too late. <laughs> With the Word of God now in electronic form, you can get rid of all the physical Bibles. It's already in another form. That's God at work preserving his teaching. Digital forms ensure even deeper preservation. Even though I'm most comfortable with a book teaching from it and reading it, I have more confidence in digital forms than in electronic forms because they've preserved it and it's more difficult to get rid of those because they can be put in different digital forms and still be preserved. That is simply God at work with this powerful message. And I want to also underline this point before we go to our last one. It's, it's the relevancy of the Bible. Not only is it God's power preserving the words or the teaching about what he's done throughout time. This message will always be relevant. Uh, in this book are not instructions about horse and buggy technology or how to wire a phonograph or how to get a tube-driven TV to work. There's nothing antiquated here where, hey, this no longer matters anymore because we've gone on to greater things. As so I've tried to repeat over and over again, the Bible deals with the human condition. It deals with a God who is trying to get us to understand we have a terminal condition. Came out in the news this week that the Princess of Wales has cancer. Everyone, everyone should be upset about that. She was already terminal, just as you and I are. All of us are terminal. Just cancer can make that terminal condition of we're going to die come a lot quicker than we want. So we're trying to rid ourselves of cancer. The statistics of death are staggering. One out of every <laughs> one person dies. But Jesus has come along through his father and presented an antidote, a vaccine, if you will, where we do not have to die in our sins, but instead can be forgiven and we can be resurrected. That is a timeless message where it can never be said, well, that doesn't matter more because we're doing greater things. No, we're not. Our technology is changing. The way we drive around is changing. But our human status is not changing. We're all terminal, and we need an answer. And that relevancy drives the Bible. God's preserving it, but the relevancy of it continues to be driven because of our human nature. The Bible deals with people in their relationship with God, but also in relationship with each other. The Bible speaks to marriage. It speaks on how to get along with your neighbor. It speaks to how to deal with money and how not to let greed uh, drive you in your life. It deals with pride, selfishness, jealousy, envy. 
Those things are always present. They were present 5,000 years ago, and they're present now. And as long as these things, these things continue to be our problem, the Bible will, will be relevant, and God will preserve it as well. The Bible's not going anywhere, and don't fear that it will. The Word of God is much more than simply a book. Our final thought is this. The Word of God is in the best position to not only survive, but thrive. The Bible is in the best position not only to survive, but thrive. Again, our keynote verse, Hebrews 4, 11, 12. Verse 12, the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I want to consider just briefly four things about the position of the Bible today. First of all, it's prominent. It is the most recognizable book. It's the only book that has its own app. It's the only book that you can recognize what it is on a table from 10 feet away. People know what this book is. They recognize it and some go forward towards it. Some, they see it and it's like you brought a snake into the room. People are very rarely ever neutral about the Bible. They say, hey, you're reading the Bible? Hey, well, that's a Bible? <laughs> It's one or the other, rarely. It is prominent. It's the only book, as I like to say, with its own bookstores. Throughout this country, there are bookstores devoted to the Bible and books related to the Bible. It's the only book with its own museum. And at the end of this lesson, just a few moments, you're going to see a video about the Bible Museum that was built in 2017 in Washington, D.C. It's the only book. It's the only revelation that has this kind of attention. It's prominent. But the Bible is also very controversial. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. It judges the thoughts and intents of the heart. Nothing is hidden from God's sight. There are a lot of things in this book that are very politically incorrect. That is, they don't go with the trends and the philosophies that are ever-changing within our country. It's going to be upsetting at times to people. They're going to read things and they're going to become glued. Others are going to get a bee in the cap. What? What did I just hear? That is good. The Bible should upset people. Sometimes in my morning devotion, it upsets me because God confronts through something I read, something that he wants removed from my life or wants to be improved. It's upsetting to hear that, yeah, I'm failing in this area. But I embrace being told things that I don't want to hear. Because I know that's good for me. It's like when I go to the doctor, I don't mean always like what the doctor says, but I embrace going. I want him to find things that need to be removed or need to be changed. The Bible always should be controversial. The biggest danger of the Bible is everyone becoming comfortable with it. I don't see that happening, but that's when we're dead in the water. When everyone's fine with the message. That means it's not provoking anyone any longer. They've disregarded it. It ought to upset atheists. It ought to upset people that just want to do what they want to do and live their life and not be bothered and not have anyone tell them what to do. It ought to bother them. So don't be surprised when someone gets upset about even seeing a Bible in the room or on the dash. It ought to be that way. Because here the writer again says, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Time is marching towards the judgment day. and Everything's going to be laid bare, and this book tells us what's coming. It ought to be controversial, expect it to be. That doesn't mean we put it in the face of people. It doesn't mean we try to hit people over the head with it and scare them and things like that. But just understand, it's going to make people uncomfortable. It's supposed to be that way. 
It has no competition. It's going to thrive because there is no other book of credible foundation that gets the attention the Bible does. We are well at dismiss, dismissing frauds and fake accounts and fake news and things like that. They get dismissed quickly because we recognize, hey, there's no truth behind this. But the Bible continues to march forward, though it's been around for centuries. Because it has credibility and people that are honest recognize this is telling me something no one else is telling me. That I have a problem with God that needs to be fixed. I can tell it in my conscience. This book points out what's wrong. And it also gives the answer. And it tells me the person behind the answer loves me dearly. It's not somebody just finding fault with me, but someone who loves me is telling me what's wrong and points the way to escape my own sin. I'm told the truth in this book. And that's why people keep running to it. And it has no competition. Self-help books will be the number one bestseller for maybe a week or two, and then something else comes on. Just like diet books. Just like diet fads. They come and go, but the Word of God stays. It endures forever. The Bible is constantly being translated into the languages of our world. It's constantly being revised to capture the English of this day. You hear Jay at times using different Bible versions. They're all Bible versions that try to capture what was said in the original Greek and Hebrew and is best captured today in this English word. We don't all use the King James Version anymore because it's an older English style. So because of the interest in the Bible, there's always this desire to put money into revising the English forms to make sure people understand the best we can what was originally said. That's because the interest is there. The Word of God is in the best position to not only survive, but to thrive. It's not going anywhere. The book may go somewhere. The book form may. Your grandchildren, my grandchildren, may not be using a book. They're, I almost guarantee you this morning in their respective churches, they're on their phones. And that's great. It'll be something different later on. But the Word itself will survive. And it will thrive. Because of the message. In fact, a few years ago, uh, English paraphrase was written by Eugene Peterson. It was in uh, the picture of the last point. And he simply put not the Bible on the cover, he put the message. And that's just fine. Because it is the message of God to the humanity whom he loves. And it speaks about how much he loves us and what he's done for us and how much he hates to lose us. The book tells us about what we can be and what he always intended for us to be as human beings. And it addresses everything in our life that needs to be addressed. And it shows us another way to live. And those who love the truth, those who want a better life than what they have, will always run to it. They'll always seek it out. They might be unnerved at times by what they find. They might be made uncomfortable. But they'll still keep coming back because they want to know the truth. Because as Jesus said, once you know the truth, the truth will what? Set you free. Exactly, Ricardo. If you want to be free, if you want to be free and not live under the weight of sin and self-deception, live a life of a fraud, you don't want that, the truths of Jesus will set you free. And the truths are there. Just a moment, we're going to sing a song to encourage us to be responsive to God's teaching. To continue to live a life of being born again and having everything always worked on till the day that God calls us home. Our greatest days are ahead. There's a great day coming and there's an eternal future that this book uh, tells us about. The message of God is alive and we are going towards these great things. Don't be left behind. Don't allow others to be left behind because they rather pursue something temporary. Go forward with God. That's the only way to go, to go forward.